All right, I think we're going to get started. Thank you very much uh, for joining in for today's Grand Rounds. Uh, uh, at a very short notice, uh, we have uh, a brilliant uh, uh, panel discussion today that is going to ensue. And I'm very uh, honored and delighted uh, that we have um, an extraordinary uh, investigator team uh, led by Dr. Philip uh, Pibaro and his uh, uh, mentee, uh, Jeremy Bernard, who have been very kind to uh, join us. Uh, Dr. Bernard and Dr. Philip Pibaro will uh, talk uh, and lend us through a collaboration work that uh, has happened over the last uh, almost uh, one and a half years uh, in the field of uh, valvular heart diseases. And today's uh, work will focus on uh, mitral regurgitation. Previously, we have had a successful journey also with uh, aortic valve diseases. Uh, Dr. Fibro uh, uh, needs uh, no introduction, but for those uh, who may be joining and getting to know him, uh, Dr. Fibro is uh, uh, one of the foremost name in valvular heart disease in the world. He's a full professor at Department of Medicine at Laval University and director of research group in valvular heart disease at Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. He holds the Canada Research Chair in Valvular Heart Disease. He leads a research program uh, where his uh, central idea is to innovate in the field of valvular heart disease. Um, and he's uh, a principal investigator of uh, several multicenter trials. Several of those, uh, like Progress Science Program, are widespread, and we are participating also in those uh, programs. Um, he has published. Uh, uh, over 250 articles, and uh, he is, he's well uh, renowned for his uh, work uh, in valvular heart disease, and he has several awards to his uh, uh, credit. Uh, and um, it's been really a privilege for me to get to know him almost about for the last five or six years when I was in West Virginia University. We started collaborating in uh, digital health and AI technology, uh, and we started developing a team uh, of collaboration. And uh, during this process, after the first uh, articles that we wrote together, uh, I was introduced to uh, a very um, enthusiastic uh, person whom you're seeing here, uh, Jeremy Bernard. Uh, Jeremy is currently uh, a postdoc. Uh, uh, he's he's in, Pursuing his PhD uh, 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 with uh, uh, under under uh, Dr. Uh, Bibro's uh, mentorship, uh, he uh, did his bachelor in medical uh, biomedical sciences, uh, University of Level in Quebec City. Subsequently, was a medicine faculty, and and uh, and he's uh, currently uh, uh, pursuing his uh, biomedical sciences PhD. Uh, I looked through his uh, CV. He's an uh, enthusiast in uh, new technology, AI. Uh, he's been uh, specifically focused in his research in mitral regurgitation and other valvular heart disease. He has uh, close to about half a dozen publications right now on mitral regurgitation. So it seems like he is the person who can really guide us through what's happening in this area. And certainly with uh, uh, Dr. Pibaro uh, under his mentorship, I think this is going to be a, a very interesting focused area for us to uh, hear uh, about from him. So today what we thought is um, we designed a project together, but uh, Dr. Bernard is going to give the first curtain razor to uh, uh, potentially a very important uh, study and, uh, and, and, and studies potentially that are coming out hot and press in the field of mitral regurgitation. And after he gives his uh, presentation, uh, I will invite Dr. Pibaro for his uh, commentary, and then we will have a Q&A session. So with that, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy and Philip for joining us. And now uh, let take us through your uh, presentation, Jeremy. Perfect. I uh, thank Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanguta, for the, this kind introduction and for the invitation uh, to present uh, in this grand round. Um, so as presented, I'm a PhD student uh, under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Uh, Pibaro, and, uh, and 
I'm, ju I'm just pleased and honored to be part of this grand round in which I, I will talk about the risk stratification and the treatment selection in mitral regurgitation. So where are we in, uh, in 2023? Uh, these are our di disclosures, uh, but the, 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 more, the most important one is um, to declare that we are both passionate about mitral valve, and I'm pleased to be the one to talk to you about it today. Um, so the objective of the grand rounds will be to review um, rapidly the etiology, the prevalence, the prognosis, the imaging, and current uh, management of MR. Afterwards, to provide up-to-date knowledge on comprehensive risk evaluation for um, referral to intervention in MR and present the outcomes of current treatment option in, in MR patient. And finally, discuss on um, the future perspective in MR clinical research and uh, innovation in treatment. So if we, um, if we go to the, the first objective, We'll just go back to the basics. What are what is MR? Um, it's really a non-coaptation of my, the, the mitral valve leaflets, uh, which provoke a backflow of, of blood in systole and thus a volume overload to the heart. Uh, there's two types of uh, of uh, MR. So the primary. Uh, form in the secondary form. In terms of the primary form, it's really a, a disease of the, the valve apparatus, so either the leaflets, the chordal, or the papillary muscle. And in sec secondary MR, it will uh, mostly be uh, a remodeling of the uh, LV or the LA, uh, which will bring uh, a DMR, and it can be due to, to a non-ischemic or an ischemic uh, uh, causes. So the degenerative form is the most prevalent one, uh, and the prevalence um, increase with age is also more prevalent in female uh, compared to men. And if we uh, look at the uh, a nice um, a nice paper in 2021, it touches around 24 million people worldwide. So um, it is really prevalent. Um, so what is MR in terms of the, the pressure volume loop um, of the LV? Um, we need to really uh, distinguish acute MR to chronic MR. Uh, acute MR is usually a, an urgency to go to intervention, but in chronic MR, there's three phase um, in which uh, the the disease uh, established. So um, there's the compensated, compensated uh, stage, there's the transitional stage and the decompensated stage. And I really think we need to intervene, intervene uh, in these patients during the translational phase and thus before the decompensated uh, stage uh, to which uh, the patient will benefit in terms of outcomes. So what is the burden of MR? Uh, there's a nice study in, in Lancet in 2018 that demonstrated that all forms of MR has a uh, significantly reduced um, survival compared to uh, in the expected uh, mortality for the, the age and sex uh, general population. Um, but we also know that the mostly patients with the primary form are at higher risk of sudden cardiac death, endocarditis, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, which which brings also a um, other problems uh, to the issue, to the issue, and in a nationwide uh, study, Mezikazetun uh, and all um, established that the one-year mortality for all forms of MR is a 14 percent. Um, and if we look at the one-year mortality and all cause readmission, we go to sixty-seven percent. If we look only at the heart failure readmission and one-year mortality, it's a 34% uh, rate, so it's it it is a really free, uh, it has really a, a high burden. And if we look at the primary and secondary form, uh, we also have uh, uh, high uh, rates of uh, of uh, these outcomes. Also for the cost of readmission, so uh, as I said, it's a burden uh, for the patient, but also for the um, or the hospital, because if we look at the primary and secondary form with or without heart failure, uh, we can see that uh, there's a high proportion of, uh, 
of patient that contributes to the cost of readmission and mostly in primary forms uh, as demonstrated here. So what's the prognosis of uh, a patient with MR uh, in the community study in uh, 2019? They, they identified that the functional uh, uh, type was more prevalent, um, but uh, it, um, it can be divided in the uh, ventricular form uh, with a 38% um, uh, prevalence and a, uh, the atrial form with a 27%. And if we look at the, the rates of mitral valve surgery in, in the lifetime for these, uh, these two subtypes of, pa uh, uh, of patient, um, we, we see that they are very low rates, so 3 and 4%, uh, which, is, uh, which is not that great um, for, um, for in terms of, uh, of treatment of, of patients. So uh, in MR, there is an under-treatment uh, issue, and we need to, uh, to work on that. Uh, also, for the organic form, there's only a 37% um, rate of mitral valve surgery. And if we look at their, um, their survival compared to the expected uh, mortality uh, in all forms, we have a reduced uh, survival. So what we need to look for in a patient with MR, uh, there's three important parts. So the mechanism of the MR, we really need to um, classify the patient in the Carpiente classification um, as demonstrated in my first slide, um, because we really need to establish the subtypes of uh, the subtype of the etiology of MR uh, by looking at the morphology of the leaflet and, uh, and of the LV. Um, also, we need to look at the severity of MR, so are the, the, the parameters to establish the severity all consistent? Do we need further testing to, um, to really establish the real severity? And I will say at, at the, le uh, the same important as, as the, um, the other two parts, what are the consequences on, of MR on the LA, LV, and uh, pulmonary circulation? And I would even go to the RV side um, because this is what will drive uh, mostly the patient prognosis. So what are the current guidelines uh, say us? Um, so in primary form, we, um, we look at the severity and the, the presence of symptoms. And if uh, there is symptoms, there's no, um, no issue. There's a, a class one indication to intervene. Um, and if we have a high or prohibitive surgical risk, um, we'll go to the transcatheter edge to edge repair. Uh, but the, the, the main issue is um, in, in which we need the improvement uh, by, by, by several papers and several uh, studies, it's really in the asymptomatic uh, um, part. So if you have a healthy systolic dysfunction defined by two criteria, so the LVF and uh, the uh, and systolic di dimension, um, there's a class one indication um, for the degenerative form. But if you don't have this uh, healthy dysfunction, um, we'll, uh, we'll look at the expected surgical mortality and the likelihood of a uh, durable repair, but there's only a 2A or 2B um, uh, recommendation in the guidelines. If we look at the secondary mitral regurgitation, as you probably know, we really need to have a optimized guideline directed medical therapy. Um, and if the patient under, uh, is undergoing cabbage, we have a 2A two, two recommendation for mitral valve surgery. And if not, we'll look at the, um, the LVF. So if we are in the HREF, uh, we'll look uh, if the anatomy is favor favorable and if uh, the patient encountered the collab cr criteria to undergo transcatheter edge to repair. And if not, uh, we'll... Uh, we'll have to, to go to the surgery. And um, if we have a uh, HPEF, uh, it's more likely to a recommendation for mitral valve surgery. And I really like this, um, this study, um, this review uh, published in 2022, in which they identified the area of uh, agreement, disagreement, and gaps in evidence in uh, in the management of MR, and I will focus the um, the presentation mostly on three uh, three important aspects. So the type of intervention for secondary MR, 
the preoperative risk stratification, and the importance of proportionate versus disproportionate MR definitions. Um, so for the, the second objective, if we look at the risk stratification in primary MR, there's a nice review that uh, came up with this, um, this figure. And in most patients, often uh, we have the LV dietation, LV dysfunction symptoms, uh, really a, a long time after the onset of severe MR. And this is where the survival will uh, significantly re uh, reduce. So we, knew, we need to establish the optimal time of surgery before uh, this uh, dietation and dysfunction of the LV and symptoms. And this is where we need to identify the subclinical dysfunction in patient with MR. There's a um, as you probably know, there's a, still a controversy regarding the management of uh, primary MR. So to identify the optimal timing for interventional referral, um, either we, we have the strategy of uh, doing a watchful waiting uh, in which uh, several studies has demonstrated that um, patient with um, asymptomatic uh, LV dysfunction or uh, atrial fibrillation has has low uh, even rates compared to a uh, uh, patient with symptoms. Uh, but other studies has also demonstrated that um, if we do early surgery in these patients compared to the medical management group, there's a benefit in terms of survival. So what are, are the tools that uh, are available to um, to really do the, the risk stratification in these patients, I think we can uh, we can put it in in, in four uh, four main tools. So either you use the current parameters uh, in the guidelines, but the pros and cons are as follows. So there's a easy me measurement. Uh, they are pro pronostically validated parameters, but they provide limited assessment of uh, subclinical dysfunction, and there is inherent limitation of these parameters. Uh, um, that we cannot uh, um, just close the eyes to, to them. And um, for the, 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 the second tool, we can use the, the published uh, risk scores um, that were derived uh, for primary MR. But the pros are the pros are that they, they provide, yes, a more comprehensive assessment, but the cons are that maybe it's too little too late uh, to use this uh, risk score because it's usually in uh, in a really advanced disease that we can establish a, a high uh, high score and the do they provide really incremental value and are they spe really specific for uh, MR pathophysiology and now we'll discuss mainly today the global uh, the global cardiac damage assessment uh, as a potential tools for risk stratification and the use of machine learning as uh, Dr. Singuta um, said in the introduction. So if we look at the current parameters, we know that symptoms un are unreliable and non-specific in valvular heart disease. Um, and if we look at the end systolic and uh, diameter and ejection fraction, there's a nice study in 2021 that demonstrated that there, there, there is a high variability of um, of a patient uh, in terms of um, in terms of the preoperative LVF compared to the immediate uh, post post of LV, LVF. So the change is not uh, that uh, similar in patient, and even if we stratify according to the uh, end systolic diameter, there's also um, that the, the 40 millimeters in the guidelines, it's more arbitrary cut of value. And what about the volumetric dietation of the, of the heart? Also the LVF, uh, we know underestimate the extent of the systolic dysfunction uh, in, in this patient because the regurgitation volume prov uh, provokes a pseudo normal LVF. So this is why in 2017, we came up with the uh, forward LVEF uh, in which we calculate, um, we calculate with the forward stroke volume as, as uh, usually uh, done um, divided by the uh, LV in the diastolic volume by tycles. And there's a nice uh, figure in this paper in which uh, we can see that the in panel A, there's a there's a patient with no mit MR and preserved LV function. We'll have the same uh, LVF for the total and forward. 
Um, and in panel B with mild MR, uh, we'll have a uh, we'll have a, a, a somehow uh, reduced forward LVF, but the same uh, the same value for the total LVF. And in panel C, so a severe MR with LV dysfunction, we'll still have a a, a standard LVF with sixty five percent. So he does not encounter the uh, the guidelines threshold. And um, but the forward LVF will be reduced to 35 percent, uh, and it's correlating with the longitudinal strain. And we came up came up with the color value of uh, fifty percent to really di discriminate patient who has event and those who, who do who do not. Um, also, the LV strain uh, in, provide in, provide some other um, um, risk stratification. Uh, value because with a color value of 18 percent authors in uh, 2018 pro um, demonstrated that it has an ability to really um establish those who have a uh, higher rates of event and it provides incremental pronostic value over standard um standard uh, model uh, with uh, with uh, standard lvf age la dimension and atrial fibrillation also recently, we uh, published that uh, a um, the LV ejection time could, could uh, also um, identify patient at higher risk with a cutoff value of a of a two hundred sixty milliseconds uh, because uh, uh, it yeah it, it, it that provide the um, value for risk stratification and it provide also um, incremental incremental pronostic value um, if we add it to uh, our clinical or full model. There's also recently uh, we published that the myocardial contraction fraction, which is calculated by the LV stroke volume by Doppler divided by the myocardial volume, uh, to which it, it can be calculated with the LV mass divided by the mean density of the myocardium. Uh, if we have a, 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 um, a MCF under 30%, this is where we'll have um, mostly the events um, for uh, uh yeah for patient um so these are really maybe other emerging parameters that we need to look for in risk stratification of patient with primary mr as i said there are risk cores in the, in the literature um that were derived for the primary uh, mr uh, in 2018 it's the meta score um that was published and they included the age symptoms, atrial fibrillation, left atrial uh, diameter, the um, pulmonary pressure, the LV and, and systolic diameter and ejection fraction. And they attributed um, some points according to the, um, the, uh, the prediction of, of mortality. Um, and they demonstrated a uh, high correlation with the Euro score and the high uh, ability to um, predict uh, outcomes for patient under medical management. But if we look at the predictive mortality after mitral valve surgery, uh, we see that uh, it's not really the case. So is it really a risk score that can be, uh, that identify patient uh, too little, too late? It's maybe, uh, it's maybe the case. Um, and they updated uh, this year the uh, MIDI uh, score with the MIDI Q score, in which they added the um, effective regurgitation orifice um, area, uh, as demonstrated here. And they they demonstrated that the that the MIDI Q score with the different categories here provided. Um, provided a. Um, um, prediction of mortality uh, at each increase uh, in uh, in meta -Q, Q score but i will focus main, mainly on the uh, the cardiac damage staging uh, as i said initially it was it was defined in the symptomatic aortic stenosis um, disease and it's a concept that uh, we we classify patient according to uh, the degree uh, and the extent of the heart damage. So in stage G, zero, we'll have no uh, cardiac damage. In stage one, we'll have uh, LV damage. Stage two, LA and mitral damage. Stage three, pulmonary uh, or tricuspid damage. And stage four, it's really end stage heart failure with uh, 
RV damage. And this concept was applied to, um, to primary MR um, in a publication in 2022, where they uh, used symptomatic pre-surgical um, patient and they uh, somehow adapted their criteria in uh, each stage. But if we look at the, um, the survival curves, yes, they can identify the, uh, the higher uh, risk group. But if we look at the other groups, um, there's not that great of the discrimination between uh, at this stage uh, um, regarding, uh, regarding this. And we, uh, we also applied this concept in the asymptomatic uh, primary MR uh, patient that were follow up uh, in our institutions. Um, and we adapted the, the concept in which in the stage one uh, will have mild LV and LA damage. And in stage two will have moderate LV or LA damage and the other stage are, are, are similar than the, the previous paper. And in our study, we identify in, the, we really had a, a, a um, stepwise increase in terms of mortality at each increase in stage, but it was uh, mainly, um, mainly um, uh, in the, the stage three and four with a 50% uh, rates of deaths in at 10 years. And we, um, we assess the incremental prognostic value in this uh, paper. And we, um, we, we see that the staging per one stage increase provided incremental uh, pronostic value in network classification index. And it was also the case for uh, if we look at the stage three and four compared to the other ones. So as I said, regarding artificial int intelligence, uh, it maybe really could provide uh, useful um, useful um, information to uh, to enhance risk stratification in these patients because we know that there is a clinical relevance in uh, valvular heart disease management because it helps us to better in understanding the complexity of the disease, uh, the interaction between the variables and Thus, identify interpretable clusters of patient. Um, it was applied uh, in uh, arctic stenosis and secondary MR as the as published in 2021 in Jack Imaging, uh, where they identify four phenotypes uh, um, in secondary MR. And the the paper that um, that Dr. Singuta said in the intro introduction uh, is uh, is the one that I will uh, talk to you about it uh, now. So uh, we use the asymptomatic uh, primary MR cohort to um, to predict the interventional benefit um, of, of mitral valve surgery. Um, and we included 24 main uh, echo feature that were measured in both cohort, but we use it in the in our French cohort uh, with unsupervised and supervised learning that uh, that help us to to identify two clusters of patients, so the low severity and the high severity uh, clusters, and we um, compare their um, association with outcomes and uh, with uh, a stratification according to a uh, mitral valve surgery occurrence. And we use explainable AI to really uh, identify the main factors that uh, um, contributes, contributes to the model output. And all this was uh, validated in the Canadian external cohort, which was really independent um, from the French cohort. So here is the um, the heat map uh, in which uh, we see the twenty four um, the twenty four echo parameters and the dendrogram that uh, established the two clusters of patient. I won't go in detail with you, but uh, um, in the interest of time. But if we look mostly at the uh, explainable AI. Um, part of the of the paper, uh, we we see that end diastolic volume, e on e prime ratio, and regurgitation volume were the top three uh, parameters to uh, to contributing to contribute to the model. So, as I said, maybe the volumetric uh, um, dilatation uh, is more uh, more robust uh, than uh, a arbitrary cutoff. Mm -hmm. 
um, as in the guidelines, but also may, the diastolic uh, function with the E on E prime ratio uh, has a real uh, contribution to the model output, and also the severity of MR, as I said, with the regurgitation volume. Uh, the end systolic dimension and ejection fraction were in the top 10 parameters, but were not the first one. Um, for the, um, the panel B here, we have the predictive performance of the, um, of the model, and we, we can see that the, the AUC was 83%, the sensitivity of 85, and the specificity of 78, which are really good results for, uh, for that kind of, uh, of study. Um, and in the panel, um, the, pa the figure four of the paper, um, if we look at the panel A, uh, so really the French cohort, uh, um, only a French cohort, and we look uh, at the occurrence of mitral valve surgery um, during follow-up, we see that the high severity phenol group, so the, the, the green curve, had a higher rate uh, our chance of undergoing a mitral valve surgery in their life, lifetime. Um, and if we look only at this phenol group, so the high severity, and we stratify according to those who uh, underwent mitral valve surgery, so the, the, the plus and those who didn't, so the, the minus, uh, we, we see that the patient who didn't uh, go to, uh, to surgery had a um, significantly higher risk of mortality which was not the case in the French cohort uh, as demonstrated uh, in the low severity phenol group, sorry, uh, as demonstrated here. And this was all validated in panel D, E, and F in the Canadian uh, independent cohort uh, as, as um, explained uh, earlier. And in the table tree of the paper, we look at the incremental performance value of the model. Um, so the addition of the model compared to the conventional uh, MR classification. And if we compare the LC index in, of, of the two, uh, we have a significant uh, improvement. And in network classification index uh, analysis and um, IDI, so in integrated discrimination improvement analysis, we have also significant uh, value for uh, incremental um, uh, pronostic value of the model. So I will uh, jump to the uh, outcomes of the current treatment option for to treat the MR patient. Um, and we'll just go back to the basics. So as you know, there is no efficient pharmacotherapy uh, for uh, reducing the MR disease. Uh, so if you have a severe MR with an indication for intervention, you usually go to surgery that can be done either by a repair or a replacement. And if you're high at high risk, um, there's th this is where you'll go to the uh, transcatheter edge ridge uh, repair um, option. So if we look at the surgery um, approaches, so in panel A, you have uh, the, the standard um, triangular resection with the use of the analog ring. Um, so it's usually what is accomplished in patient because it's mostly prolapses in P2 or uh, P, P1, P, P3 or A, A1. Uh, but I will focus also on the uh, panel B here, where uh, when you have flail, uh, so a coil rupture, um, you can use the um, you can use uh, the um, the approaches that um, that takes the um, artificial cords. So it really helps to provide uh, to preserve the subapparatus function uh, of the uh, of the mitral valve and thus uh, the hemodynamic of the of the heart. Um, and in panel D and F, you have the replacement, so either by a mechanical or a biological valve. But you can also do in mitral valve replacement cordial sparing, in which the, the surgeon will uh, will keep the original um, uh, cord and will attach them to the uh, prosthesis. So what to do in uh, what to, to select in primary MR. So if you, you can do a repair in primary MR, you do a repair because it provides really um, durable, um, durable uh, correction of the MR uh, and also low uh, mortality as um, 
published uh, recently in the Jack uh, um, Journal. So they use the STS database and they identified that the 90 percentile was 1.7 percent which is pretty low for uh for the surgical risk and if you cannot do a repair you, you'll do a replacement and in high risk patient as i said the transcatheter edge edge repair so when will we do a re replacement it's mostly when um you'll have a bilifid severe barlow disease with a moderate with a moderator severe calcification with severe anodilatation uh, or even a rheumatic valve disease, uh, because this is where the repair won't be uh, as uh, as efficient and as durable uh, compared to standard pos posterior prolapse uh, uh, with non-normal calcification. And what about tear in primary MR? So transcatheter edge ridge repair. Um, there's a nice study in 2022 that um, compared the tear to the unoperated uh, patient. Uh, so a elderly, uh, severe symptomatic, high-risk uh, degenerative MR uh, population, and they uh, demonstrated that the tier uh, group has a uh, benefit in terms of survival. Uh, and even if uh, we um, divided this group uh, according to the residual MR after tier, uh, so if you have a trivial or, or mild MR after tier, it's okay. You'll have, you'll have the, bene uh, the survival benefit. But if you leave a moderate or severe MR, uh, it's uh, is as it uh, that you, it's like you, you you didn't correct the um, the MR and you have the same uh, outcomes uh, as the unoperated um, um, group. So what about the the rates of surgery we compare to uh, uh, tier? So there's a nice study also in Jack recently that demonstrated in a fourteen. Thousand uh, population of degenerative MR from the SDS database. That um, if we compare the surgery performed before versus after the uh, institution uh, first transcatheter mitral valve repair, we see no significant changes in annular uh, mitral valve repair volume and improved risk uh, uh, adjusted at 30 days and five year uh, regarding to the mortality. So. Really, the tear in uh, primary MR will be uh, mainly uh, reserved to the um, high surgical uh, risk, high risk surgical patient. Um, so, what about secondary MR? As you probably know, we we need to have a multidisciplinary heart team uh, to really. Um, choose the best treatment for a given patient. So uh, both heart failure uh, specialists for the guideline directed medical therapy, uh, but also CRT specialists, transcatheter uh, specialists, and sur surgeon in the, in the heart team to, uh, to, to really um, select the best uh, treatment. Um, what about the surgery in, in um, secondary MR? So um, the, this New England Journal of Medicine article in 2016 um, randomized pa patient to replacement compared to repair in ischemic um, MR, so a, a subtype of a secondary MR. And there's no difference in terms of death and um, occurrence of MACE. Uh, but if we look closely at the cumulative failure of mitral valve repair compared to replacement, there's a slight favor towards mitral valve repair, so less uh, failure uh, over time. Uh, this is why some, in, a lot of institutions uh, will prefer a mitral valve replacement over repair in uh, in secondary MR. So, what to choose in mitral valve uh, replacement? There's a um, there's a study in New England that uh, will demonstrate well the um, the rates of uh, the use of mechanical versus biological valve from 1995 to uh, 2010, and we see a significant um, decrease in terms of the use of mechanical with a slight increase of uh, biological valve. But if we look at the guidelines, uh, what is the, the, the trigger? So the, um, the, the things to, 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 to check before uh, choosing to uh, um, the, pr the prosthesis in mitral valve replacement, it's the patient age. And we only refer to the patient age with a, a value of 65 years. Um, but I 
I think we need to have a more comprehensive uh, assessment uh, uh, before the, the process is uh, selection, because in uh, in a study that we published in 2021, uh, we compared the biological to mechanical valve in ischemic MR uh, population in propensity score match and IPTW um, analysis, and we uh, we we obtained result that. Uh, um, the early prosperative outcomes are similar between the, the two uh, type of valve, uh, but if we look at the long-term outcomes, the all-cause mortality is the same, but the readmission for cardiovascular causes stroke or major bleeding uh, is higher in mechanical valve. So maybe the biological valve will be the um, the the uh, the more preferred choice in in that uh, population. Uh, so maybe also we need to to look at the specific subtypes of uh, the MR etiology uh, in terms of, uh, of processes uh, uh, selection. We'll look further at the um, surgical treatment of, um, of uh, secondary MR. There's a, maybe an evolution towards less invasive, um, so less invasive uh, approaches. Uh, there's uh, two device, two extra cardiac device that uh, were developed, so the core cap and coapsis device, uh, to really remodel the LV uh, by extra cardiac way. Um, but the randomized control trials on this um, demonstrated, yes, the safety and the efficacy and a significant LV remodeling, but no superiority over mitral valve repair for uh, MR reduction and mortality. And maybe, I think maybe that it, it, it's because it's not, um, it didn't, uh, um, it, 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 it isn't, sorry, at the, um, at the base of the heart because um, another device that was developed, uh, which is a base device, um, demonstrated that, um, at six months, uh, uh, good result in terms of, uh, uh, of the, the study endpoints. Uh, the base device is the external, uh, so extra cardiac device in which you'll have uh, some fluid chambers um, and you can uh, inflate or deflate them um, with, this, with subcutaneous ports. And it, it provided uh, in, the, in our study that we published in 2022, um, a 94% uh, implanted success, a 100% freedom from major device-related adverse event, and 82% um, efficacy, so uh, defined as uh, um, secondary MR under mild. Um, and we saw also uh, a significant uh, LV modeling, also a, a um, improvement in terms of quality of life and a decrease in functional status. So what about here in uh, secondary MR? As you probably uh, saw, the, these two uh, randomized control trials, so the COAP and mitral LFR, that um, provided really discordant result uh, in terms of uh, prediction of uh, a heart failure hospitalization and um, and and death. Um, and there's there was a lot of discussion in the literature about this uh, these two randomized control trial, but I think. Uh, Philip brought up uh, uh, so, so so really uh, important uh, um, um, important informa information because if we compare the mitral FR and COAP trials, we see that there uh, there is mainly uh, most uh, most severe uh, MR in the COAP trial and less LV and, and systolic. Uh, um, dietation defined by the um, the end systolic and diastolic sorry uh, volume index, and this is where uh, he, he came up with um, with a, a nice picture in which will uh, it, it help us to identify in in which patient at the meter clip so the tear will be futile and in which will it will be uncertain or useful. So if you have a mild to moderate MR regardless of the uh, systolic dysfunction, this is where the tear will be futile. But if you have a moderate to severe MR with a severe LV systolic dysfunction, this is where it will be in, uncertain. Uh, as demonstrated in mitral FR, and if you have a moderate to severe MR with a mild to moderate LV systolic dysfunction, this is where it will be useful. 
But after this, uh, these results, um, in the literature, there is the proportionality framework that, um, that was uh, published. Um, and it, it's based on, on the, uh, the idea that uh, in proportionate MR, the degree of MR will be um, related to the size of the LV. But in this proportionate MR, um, the degree of the MR won't be uh, related to the uh, LV size. Um, so it really unexpectedly lar uh, uh, large uh, MR jet uh, compared to the LV, um, LV dietation. And this is uh, th this was uh, this led the authors to um, identify uh, that co-op and Everest two trials were mainly uh, disproportionate MR type, and um, Metro FR, FR was uh, mainly proportionate uh, MR type. Uh, but I I ask a question: Does it fully uh, follow the pathophysiology in chronic secondary MR? Because we need to have this vicious cycle in, in our head when we assess a, a, um, a singular MR patient. Um, yes, the LV remodeling will bring some, uh, some annular dilatation and uh, papillary muscle displacement, which will uh, bring the secondary MR. And, but the, also the secondary MR will uh, worsen LV dilatation and the cycle will, uh, will uh, begin uh, another tour. Um, so, in chronic MR, there is really a large spe spe spectrum of uh, LV dysfunction uh, in secondary MR. So uh, you'll have patients with severe abnormal uh, LV, um, but also mild to mod moderately abnormal LV, and some that will have the normal LV with the same degree of MR. Um, and this is what led uh, Barco and all in Jack. Um, to, to this, uh, this picture uh, in which he proposed a unifying concept uh, for the quantitative assessment of uh, singularity MR. So he, he said that maybe the, the regurgitation fraction, um, which is the, the regurgitation volume to the uh, stroke volume uh, ratio, um, if you have a 50% um, cut of value. This is where you'll uh, establish if the patient is at low or high risk. And this is what led us to um, establish this reappraisal of the uh, proportionate framework in which we'll, we'll say that the, we need to look at the LV dilatation proportionality to the MR severity because in chronic MR, this is what uh, important. It is important. Um, so, if you have a secondary MR that uh, is defined by a regurgitation fraction over 3% with uh, a reduced ejection fraction and heart failure symptoms, if you have an extreme LV dilatation as demonstrated here, um, this is where uh, you'll consider other therapeutic option or pal palliative care. But if not, we'll have to assess the LV dilatation versus the MR severity proportionality. And if you have a small LV dilatation, this is where we'll, we'll have to rule out the overestimation of MR severity. And if you have a proportionate LV dilatation, this is where you'll encounter uh, the, um, the co-op like a patient uh, and will likely benefit from tear. But if you have an excessive LV dilatation, uh, you'll mostly uh, have some mitral FR like patient and you'll less likely benefit from tear. So I'll just finish on a uh, on, on small uh, discussion uh, on future perspective in MR, uh, clinical research and future in innovation. As you probably know, there's a lot of, uh, of interest in terms of uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair or replacement uh, device, so both the PASCAL uh, that demonstrated uh, its early result uh, uh, recently and um, some some other uh, transcatheter um, mitral valves uh, that are in, in investigation uh, now, and I really like this um, this sum up of the uh, re clinical research that needs to be done in primary MR that, uh, that was uh, established by Francesca Delling um, recently in Jack. And there's three research priority that uh, we need to focus on our uh, our 
future research. So the comprehensive clinical and imaging and biologic um, assessment of a DMR patient, but also a comprehensive risk assessment uh, in larger retrospective and prospective cohorts and assessment of outcomes in diverse communities. And that's, that will uh, help us uh, optimizing the clinical decision-making process in, this, in these patients. So in conclusion, MR is a major healthcare burden. So you need to treat it when recommend, recommended and as soon as possible. The timing of intervention in primary MR is, is challenging and the use of new emerging parameters in partnership with guideline-based parameters can offer um, some insights regarding uh, the subclinical dysfunction um, in this patient. And there's an evolution toward a more comprehensive integration of uh, parameters of global heart damage and MR severity. So with the use of cardiac damage staging and machine learning as demonstrated, because it provides incremental pronostic value for risk stratification. And we need to I, individualize the um, treatment according to the subtypes of MR, because it is really paramount to, uh, to have a good um, possible plus intervention and long-term outcomes. So I'll just uh, finish by um, really thank the Dr. Pibero and Dr. Singuta for the mentorship uh, regarding the, the recent paper and uh, different collaborators, uh, our team and uh, funding agencies. Uh, um, so really thank you for the invitation and I'll be pleased to answer some questions in the uh, panel discussion and Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Philip. And I mean, this area is so well covered and so broad uh, that Jeremy did such an outstanding job. And, and despite your pace was not very fast, I'm, I'm very impressed that you covered a really large spectrum of information. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, talk. Uh, now I'll invite uh, Philip. So I, I want to uh, maybe focus uh, uh, your attention towards two aspects. Uh, number one is um, it looks like uh, valvular heart diseases um, are challenging. There is a lot of lot of thinking you have to do. Uh, so it's not just you do the echo and you can just make the report. My my challenge and our challenge is that the volumes of patients that are coming in through our labs, where is the thinking time? And I think that's the biggest problem that we experience is that um, the sonographers and yeah. our uh, doctors do not have the thinking time. How do we how do we tackle this? Because uh, this is uh, one of the primary reason I think MR or uh, some of their um, things uh, they they get under recognized. And to top that all, uh, we give a lot of importance to symptoms in in cardiology, uh, but maybe symptoms are too late uh, in valvular heart diseases, and we're recognizing. So we we really have a challenge there. Absolutely, we have a challenge, and 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 and, and Jeremy, uh, I think uh, tell, told uh, about everything. So, <laughs> uh, but but yes, I think you know um, this is a challenge because we have a lot of information to integrate, and we always have to remember that, of course, we pay a lot of attention grading the severity of valve disease and grading the severity of MR, and we do all this uh, fancy quantitation, the PISA, etc., to finally say, well, is it mild, is it moderate, is it severe, is it moderate to severe? Uh, but at the end of the day, we should always keep in mind that what kills the patient and determine the outcome is not the valvular lesion per se, but more the repercussion, the consequences of this valvular, this MR, uh, on the cardiac chamber. And this is why you can not only grade accurately the severity of MR, you also have to look at the other uh, echo parameters and, and the structure and function of the cardiac chamber. And this is why with Jeremy, we, we felt it was very important to come up with this notion of cardiac damage, which is based on a simple classification. So it kind of integrates all the parameters we measure into four stages uh, to simplify, I think, the workflow and enhance the risk stratification. Because if you have, you know, a, 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 a severe or even moderate to severe primary MR with advanced cardiac damage stage, I think this is an argument for considering an early intervention, even in the absence of symptoms. And I think this is very important. You know, if if you have a severe MR and and, and symptoms 
then it's a no-brainer. You know, you 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 even maybe don't look to to you don't need to look at the other parameters. You know, except for restratification and maybe selecting the type of intervention of uh, mitral valve intervention that you you will select. Um, but you know, if you have no symptoms, this is falsely reassuring because what we found in MR, same in AS, true asymptomatic patient, the majority, 60% or more, they have advanced cardiac damage stage. Although they have really no symptom, they are really asymptomatic, but doesn't mean that they have no cardiac damage and they are not at risk for outcomes in the short term and that sh they should not benefit from earlier uh, intervention. And what we learned from, you know, the data in MR for a long time and in AS as well, more data, the more we dig, the more the conclusion is that we should intervene earlier and earlier before uh, the cardiac damage occur. Because what we also found uh, uh, in AS, and I think this data are to come in MR, but that the cardiac damage, once it's there, even if you do a successful, the most successful intervention, it is irreversible to some extent, and very few patients are coming back to normal then. So I think we probably need to uh, to go into earlier intervention, but we I think earlier intervention is not for all patients also. So we need these tools, such as cardiac damage stage, such as maybe BNP, blood biomarkers, maybe CMR, to individualize and optimize the timing of intervention. And also what we, we've done together, Parto, you know, about this machine learning. Maybe this is the ultimate solution for the management, the integration of all these parameters that are multiple. Of course, we just talk about echo, but you know, what about the clinical? Maybe the CG, the CMR, the blood biomarker, the proteomic, metabolomic that will come in, 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 the, in, in, in the clinical workflow at some point. This will bring to us more and more data. And as you said, our time to think and integrate all this is, is, is shrinking. And anyway, you know, we have less and less time, more and more patients, and we have more and more data and information in a given patient at a given time point. And, and if you multiply by the different time points, it becomes almost impossible to manage. And this is where I think we'll need AI to not to replace us, hopefully, <laughs> but to assist us, you know, because the, the final decision will uh, ultimately, you know, come to, I hope, a human being, but at least for some years. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, um, and that's, this is why I think this cardiac damage stage and things and, and machine learning, you know, is important. Interestingly, you know, what we found in this work is that the, the, the few parameters that you have in the guidelines that are outside of the severity of MR, the, the triggers for intervention, which are LVF and LV and systolic diameter, were actually not those that came up first in our machine learning work. Mm -hmm. So, and same if you remember in AS. <laughs> yeah. So it were not, you know, the, the, the one that you have, you know, in, the, in AS, it's even less. You only have the LVF, like, uh, to, to assess the cardiac damage, you know. And the LVF was not coming uh, uh, very, uh, very well in the, in the machine learning for AS. So I think this is a message here because the machine is not biased. It, it gives you what, what, you know, predict the best, the outcomes, right? So, so this is, I think to me, this was a take home message that we need to do more. We need to do more comprehensive. We need to integrate not only LVF and LV and systolic diameter, which are marker of LV uh, systolic uh, dysfunction and we should integrate all, all, all the other parameters. The fact, for example, that the E over A ratio uh, was coming out pretty, pretty, pretty strong, you know, in the, in the machine learning is a message is that maybe we ignore yeah, LV and diastolic dysfunction and mitral flow, whereas, yeah, in MR, it is important. <laughs> so I think it's, uh, yeah. And, and Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, so, you know, we are, uh, we are uh, in a habit of trying to look at the natural history study. So your MR curve, uh, where it was going through the translational phase, and then it turns downwards uh, very quickly. Uh, I don't know if everybody does that same way, right? Maybe someone takes a really steep curve very early on. And because I feel like mitral regurgitation and valvular disease, there's a lot of individual variations that you see. Uh, and 
I think our preconceived notions about that that things progress linearly. Maybe even I don't know. Maybe you have data of serial studies that have been done of how does it uh, the damage evolve? Maybe it is not linear. It maybe it is very exponential. Maybe one thing when it happens and the whole thing curve shifts very rapidly. This is only the beginning of our ability to understand. What, what are your thoughts about uh, about that? Because I'm I feel like. A lot of us, we look at our patient, they're asymptomatic, they have this and that, and we feel like, you know, maybe we can examine them in three or four months time or six months time. Maybe not. Maybe we do not know much about how the interactions and things will change and uh, and guidelines are guidelines, but I think there's a lot of knowledge to yet, that, that to be yet to be discovered, I, I believe. Yeah. Thanks for the great great question. So, um, yeah, the curve it's 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 a review. It, it just wanted to uh, illustrate um, what happens in in a high proportion of patients, but I don't think it's the same linear curve uh, with the, the 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 high decrease at the end as uh, as you said. Uh, we need we really need to individualize the assessment also in. Um, uh, in our um, in our clinical setting um, for for a given patient, um, and there's there's a, there's not much data uh, published on the uh, the progression of uh, of both the MR but also the the, the cardiac damage. So the the um, LV remodeling and 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 also there's a small study that. Uh, demonstrated that the um, initial severity and the annular dilatation would be the main predictors of, uh, of um, progression of the MR, but there's just that in the literature. So there's a lot of work to do on, on this. And, and also, as you said, on the, um, on the LV remodeling progression of the LV remodeling and cardiac damage, so maybe see the evolution of the uh, cardiac damage in uh, in serial uh, echocardiograms uh, on on primary MR patient. Yeah, and and what would be? I mean, maybe serial echocardiogram is not a good easy way to do it in the sense in real life we cannot keep on imaging people. But uh, perhaps imagine if you have just maybe moderate MR you discovered on an echo and you could develop some surrogates of digital biomarkers like ECG variables, their walk times, that somehow could reflect the change in their cardiac stage that is happening we could utilize those surrogates better because I think right now we're waiting for symptoms to develop. And, and then, and, and then suddenly you come and my biggest worry is that I see a patient symptoms and they're already proportionate MR. I mean, they're LV shot and the, um, because we waited for the symptoms to develop and heart failure to develop. So we need some form of a surrogate so that we can leave them with those uh, biomarkers to be seen and, I mean, EKG may be uh, EKG damage or uh, variable biomarkers of damage. We could, we should think about doing a natural history study with EKG and all of this done simultaneously to see what picks up the change. And because then we can use those um, surrogates to be able to follow our patients in clinics because right now we are waiting for symptoms and that may be just too late. Yeah, yeah I think I you're don't... right. Um, I think you, you need to develop and validate uh, surrogate biomarkers, you know, and, and could be, and, and simple, uh, e easy to get, you know, could be yes. ECG, which is easy, could be also blood biomarkers, you know, it's, it's, yes. it's getting simpler and simpler and the costs are going down, you know. We, I think at some point we're going to follow the proteomic and metabolomic of these patients, you know, and, 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 and of course we'll have to find a signature uh, that tells us that you know the, uh, the the cardiac chamber and the left ventricular function, etc., is starting to decline, and we yes. need early early marker to intervene. So, and 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 you, I think you mentioned something very important, which is changes over time, mm -hmm. and that's what we do clinically because most of the studies that have been done so far in research, you take a, a snapshot at a given time, you know, at the baseline and when the patient was recruited in the study. And then with this baseline echo or baseline biomarkers, you try to predict the future. But the, the future is very difficult to predict, right? So um, whereas when you have, you repeat the measurement of some echo parameters, blood biomarker, 
And if there is changes in this biomarker, yes. then it becomes very important information. Same as BNP, you know, BNP in most valvular disease is, is a good predictor. Yes. The problem is that the cutoff uh, where you predict, you know, is very viable from one study to the other in AS, in MR, etc. And I think rather than the absolute value, you should more change at the BNP. You know, if the BNP is stable over time in a given patient, okay, that's fine. But then if it is uh, all of a sudden it's going up, then it's probably the time we need to intervene, you know. And of course, we need to develop biomarkers that are more sensitive than the BNP because I think when the BNP is increasing, as you said, probably uh, yeah. it's never too late. But yes, maybe uh, maybe we should have intervened earlier. Yes, um, uh, Jeremy, you were mentioning something, yeah. Yeah, I know Philip <laughs> said it, yes. but, uh, but, but yeah, I think it's both uh, the integration of uh, biomarkers uh, yes. uh, from, from the blood standpoint, from the echo standpoint, and, uh, and even CMR in, in, in these patients, because in prolapse uh, uh, patient, we see some, um, some fibrosis on the uh, papillary muscles uh, in CMR. So this will bring uh, also some, some, um, some insight in terms of the uh, progression of the, um, of the um, LV dysfunction. So yeah, it's a whole integration. Yes, uh, so a, lot of, a lot of work to be done. I know that we are well over eight minutes, but I, I just wanted to, to uh, have a very quick shout out from uh, Phillips about, uh, I, we really do not know much about atrial MR. Uh, that's a completely different um, new AF related um, change that is coming on and probably is associated with a lot of comorbidities, calcification and degenerative changes. It's going to be a, a lot of, those we are going to see in the future, and it's going to be a tough one. Uh, we are starting to encounter it. Philip, uh, what, what are your thoughts about um, functional MR related to AF? It's the new kid on the block, but but it's not new. It, it has always existed. It's just because, you know, uh, it, it has recently been uh, recognized, a bit like paradoxical low flow gradient in AS, you know. Uh, it was there forever, but it... I think we realized, you know, that we 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 had incorporated, included this functional MR, like thinking it they were from the left ventricle, but on the other end, say, oh, you know, some 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 functional MR, there is not much tethering, not much dilation of the left ventricle, and it looks like it's more the dilation of the uh, atrial annulus and the left atrial enlargement that is the cause, and then ah, oh, okay, this is maybe functional atrial MR. And, and, and yes, I think it's, um, it's going to be uh, something we have to pay more attention. Uh, this is another classification. I think the identification of the, 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 the severity of MR is important, always keeping in mind it's a continuum, but the identification of the mechanism is even maybe as important. And I think we need to recognize this patient. One thing that is, um, I think, uh, intriguing and that we need to pay more attention uh, there was, uh, Jeremy mentioned the, the, the disparity and, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, in the diagnosis and access to care and response to mm -hmm. treatment, which is important. And I want to underline the point of women versus men, the sex specific disparities. And this is where, you know, most of the degenerative MR is more prevalent in men than women. And, um, and for MR in general, you know, whereas MS, uh, especially rheumatic MS, rheumatic MR, uh, MAC is more prevalent in, in women. But there is one category of functional MR that is more frequent in women and much more frequent. This is atrial functional MR. And same issue with tricuspid regurgitation, where tricuspid regurgitation is in large part secondary, secondary to mitral and dilation. And again, TR is much, much more prevalent in women. And we don't understand why. There is something with the analysts, the mitral and tricuspid analysts of women that we don't understand. It seems to dilate more and to cause this functional MRTR. And I think this is something. So uh, when we say integrative approach, you know, and including all parameters, this include all echo parameters, biomarker, but very important to keep in mind that we also have to incorporate the age, sex, and also the... Um, the uh, ethnicity in all this uh, this algorithm that we'll, uh, we'll have in the future. 
Thank you very much. I wanted to just quickly uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Rohan Shah, Dr. Navina Yanmala, who are the co-authors of the work and uh, for the fantastic collaboration that has happened. It's, you're going to see it soon, hopefully, in the in the in the press. Uh, so thank you once again. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, you are just listening to Philip and Jeremy. And Philip, by the way. Is, is the guru of valve lahar diseases uh, and is well recognized uh, he's uh, one of those pioneers who has contributed to all the understanding of low flow low gradient and all the phenotypes of aortic stenosis that we've been talking about so it's been a pleasure to have uh, both of you here uh, philip and jeremy and we look forward to continuing this discussion and and collaboration in the in the near future thank you very much and good night it's thank been you. a pleasure and honor thank you so much to you Thank, Thank you. you. Have a Bye -bye. good night.